I'd like to introduce Dr. Philip Lubin. He's a professor of physics at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, whose primary research has been focused on studies of the early universe and the millimeter wave bands, as well as application of directed energy for planetary defense and relativistic propulsion. His group has designed, developed, and fielded more than two dozen ground-based and balloon-borne missions and helped develop two major cosmology satellites. Uh, he is a co-investigator on the Planck mission and has uh, spent uh, quite a bit of effort over the last few years working on directed energy systems and how we might use uh, that to propel spacecraft to other stars. And he's on his way to Alpha Centauri, apparently. Uh, is he over here, Philip? There he is, come on up. Oh, okay. Okay, well, um, what I'll do is I'll stand up when you need to wrap up and then we'll have five minutes for questions after that, so. Hello, everybody. Uh, so let's see, I wanna go over some fairly uh, detailed analysis of where we are with this program. And just to give you a little bit of background, some of you know a little about me, but may not know a lot. So I started as a field theorist um, at Harvard, and then I went to uh, Berkeley to finish my PhD, uh, transferred into some high energy physics, I uh, had a catastrophic mission failure, which destroyed my uh, thesis project, and then I switched into cosmology. So I made lemonade out of a lemon. Um, and then something uh, quite interesting happened. Um, when I was at Berkeley, I was working at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab uh, as part of what was called Group A, um, which is uh, affectionately called the Alvarez Group because the head of the group was Louis Alvarez. And at that time, he and his son, uh, Walter Alvarez, we're working on what is the clay layer associated with the uh, parent destruction of the dinosaurs 65 years, million years ago. Uh, and we would have these talks uh, at lunch. We'd all go to lunch, and he and his son would be talking about, with, you know, what, what, what is this clay layer? So Glenn Seaborg, um, who was in Building 70, had a very sophisticated uh, nuclear isotope uh, facility. And they analyzed the clay layer and found, uh, as, as you might know, a very large amount of iridium. Iridium is not a common element in the Earth's crust. And so the idea uh, was floating around, where did the iridium come from and why is it associated with the clay layer and why is it associated with the apparent death of the dinosaurs? So you might say, what does this have to do with interstellar travel? Well, I'll tell you, um, it has a lot to do with it. So at that time, then the leading hypothesis came to be uh, the Earth was impacted by a roughly 10 kilometer sized asteroid which then destroyed the dinosaurs, so extinction can be a good thing, unlike the uh, discussion we had the other day. So I would posit that extinction can be positive. Um, at least we came out of it. But in, my, in the back of my mind, there was always this little thing clicking around of, I wonder if we could prevent something like that. So fast forward to 2009, um, I'd been starting to think about the work that uh, I was um, at some DOD meetings and talking about uh, directed energy systems for programmatic purposes. And I thought, you know, what would happen if we scale that up? Could we use it to defend the planet? Uh, and then there, that was the genesis of this entire project in, in my mind. This happened around 2009. Uh, and then about two weeks later, I, I thought, well, we could use the same system that I was starting to look at, which is namely um, in a phased array of lasers to produce uh, what we needed for long distance applications. And then just dawned on me two weeks later to use the same thing for relative physics flight. So I was completely unaware of the work in um, relativistic flight that had been done by Robert Ford in the 1960s. Never uh, looked into that because it was nothing of interest to me. Um, I did talk to Dick Garwin, who was a colleague of mine, and he reminded me um, uh, relatively recently that he wrote a paper in 1958 on solar sails. And I don't know if you know who Richard Garwin is. It was quite a... Uh, formidable person. He's still alive, by the way. Okay, so um, that's the genesis of this for me. Um, and some of you think it happened relatively recently. It didn't. It actually happened around 1980. The, the thought was planted in my mind. Um, and then fast forward to 2009 at this DOD meeting, and then the rest is kind of history. So 
We've been well supported by a number of agencies, NASA among them. Um, when we first submitted the Planetary Defense Fund, they said this is too outrageous. Okay, I said, fine. So next year, we submitted three proposals. Um, one was for planetary defense, one was for um, relativistic travel, uh, and the other was a uh, composition analysis. Um, so they funded the relativistic travel one that was from a 2014 proposal, it was funded in uh, early 2015. And uh, then we got going. Uh, one day I ran into uh, Pete Warden at a 100-year Starship meeting that um, May Jemison put together in Santa Clara in October 2015, told him about our NASA work. Um, he said, send me whatever you have, which I happened to have the paper that I had submitted to um, we'll call the Roadmap to Interstellar Flight. He handed it to his friend, unknown to me, uh, who that was, and that's what kicked off from Starshot. So here we are. Uh, it's a little bit later than we started, but we're now, I, by my last count, I've written about 2,000 pages of technical documents, um, including a 700-page um, a two-volume book, which was recently published. So that's the field theorist in me that just loves to write and loves mathematics and physics um, and bores the crap out of other people. But if you want to know uh, where the genesis of this, go to our website and take a look at our stuff. So, okay, let's get started. All right, so I want to thank uh, NASA, uh, first of all, and thank Limitless Space, who's also fun us. Sonny is here. Uh, Ron Turner is right there from NASA. Um, and we're just finishing up a two-year program also with NASA, not from the NIAC program, but from another program for lunar um, uh, directed energy programs. And to the Breakthrough Initiatives, who had the vision to see that this would be a way forward to interstellar flight. Okay, so is interstellar feasible? I think that's one thing we'd like to understand. Um, and the problem is that reality kind of sucks. I mean, physics is just hard. So maybe we'll invent new physics. That'd be great. Uh, or discover new physics, but right now I'm going to stay on the real axis for the moment. Um, so to really tackle this problem, you have to understand what the fundamental limits of our known physical reality is. So things like chemical ion engines, nuclear, um, even though we had the beautiful talk the other day on fusion, um, but I would include fusion in this, um, solar cells will not work for relativistic flight. And by relativistic flight, I mean, say, greater than 10% the speed of light. Okay, so you can argue with me with that. I'm happy to argue with you about it. So if you look at Daedalus, they were claiming they could get to around 12% the speed of light, but I would claim that was kind of a dicey, um, dicey thing. So what we really want is like we see in the movies. You, you push a warp button and you go flying across the galaxy or another galaxy or wherever you want, and you come back home, it's just the same as it was before. Your friends are still there. That doesn't work in our reality. It just does not work. And this is a, a complete misunderstanding people have. Now you can go anywhere you want, as fast as you want on your clock, but you can't go anywhere you want as fast as you want on the clock at home. That's the problem. So you can go anywhere in the universe you want on your clock as fast as you want, but when you come back, it's not the same space-time point that you left. Okay. Okay, so we have a long-term roadmap to where we're going. And um, I would say, you know, at the moment, we're kind of down here. We're doing laboratory testing, starting outdoor testing. We've developed beacon-locked um, directed energy phased arrays, which are called MOPA systems, master oscillator power amplifier. Um, so we'll kind of follow on the last talk we had on lasers. Um, we're about to embark on building systems that can go from Earth to LEO um, and then follow on to GEO. And then you kind of go up the map here, uh, Earth to Moon. Uh, fast solar system missions, which I'll discuss in a bit, and then finally out of the solar system. So it's a roadmap. It's not a one goal program. And that has to be incorporated, otherwise you'll never get funded. No one's going to fund you, in, in my opinion, my experience, to do an interstellar mission because the costs of such a thing are really quite high. But if you deliver something interesting and useful to people along the way that you uh, want to go on this roadmap, then you can be funded. And that is a key element. Okay, so if you can't sleep, or you're a masochist, or you know, you're know you into whatever kind of masochism you're into, you know, read this book, because there's 700 and something pages of just mathematics, charts, plots, et cetera, and the field theorist comes out. But everything from radiation effects, from hitting the interstellar medium as you're flying through, 
um, to slowing down from hitting the CMB photons to hitting dust grains to um, phaser phased array laser systems, um, atmospheric transmissions, you know, CN squareds, atmospheric perturbations. It's all covered in this book. All right, so knock yourself out. Okay, so uh, the basic are you know kind of cartoon drawing of this is you have a really bright flashlight, which in our case is a phased array, and use it in two modes. One mode is what we call indirect drive, which is shown here. You take the light from your flashlight and reconvert it on board the spacecraft. The, laser, the light, the flashlight stays home. So do leave home without it, to quote a credit card. Um, and you then take that electricity that you generate and drive a high uh, performance ion engine. And then you flip the ion engine around because crashing on Mars is not a good option for if you have people on board. Uh, and then you can get to Mars in 30 days. Okay. Um, I'll show you that more in a bit. Then if you want to go interstellar, you take the same system. So this is this multi-use, multimodal capability. Use the same system and use momentum transfer instead of transferring it to an ion engine. And then you can go relativistic. Same technology. It has many, many uses. This is just a couple of them. Okay, so there's some really unpleasant numbers. And I'm going to blast through this because you don't want to hear about it in general. But um, the rest mass uh, MC squared is about... Um, 10 to the 17 joules per kilogram. So 21 megatons per kilogram. That's the rest mass of energy. If you convert it, if you annihilated a kilogram of matter uh, into complete energy, you'd get 21 megatons per kilogram. So the largest thermonuclear weapon ever detonated was called Sarbamba. It was a Soviet uh, device. It was a three-stage device. Annihilated about 2.8 kilograms. Uh, weighed about 30 tons, by the way. It's 58 megaton yield. So put this in perspective, a megaton is about 48 grams of matter annihilated. So people that want to use uh, matter, antimatter annihilation engines should think about this. So a gigawatt hour, which is California uses about 25 to 30 gigawatt hours per day. A gigawatt hour is about a kiloton of equivalent energy. So California is detonating 25 tactical nuclear weapons per day. It's legal in California. Okay, you can do it. All right, as long as it's for recreational use, you can do it. A terawatt hour is a megaton, okay? The United States uses of order terawatt hours, okay, per day. A petawatt hour uh, is, is a gigaton, okay, which is then getting up to close to the U.S. strategic arsenal, which is about seven uh, gigatons, which is about 350 kilograms of matter annihilated. So why am I telling you all these numbers, right? Because I want you to suffer, yes? Because I teach for a living. No, because I want you to keep this in perspective. It's really important. Okay, so the total world's peak electrical production is about 10 terawatts um, or 10 megatons per hour. We are detonating 10 megatons per hour um, to drive our economy, okay, or about half a kilogram per hour annihilated. Okay, total, work ele total world um, electrical peak production in a year is about 90 petawatt hours or 90 gigatons. So in a year, the world uses much more energy than the entire world's uh, nuclear arsenal, about 10 times, okay? So one gram spacecraft at, say, 30% the speed of light, it's about a kiloton. It's a tactical nuclear weapon. A kilogram at the same speed as a megaton. A thousand metric ton, which I'll show you in a moment, that might be human compatible, is a teraton, a trillion tons, which is getting up to extinction level uh, impacts. So that's about 11 years of total world peak production. This is important. So we were called one day by the Avatar team to design a system that would drive them to 70% the speed of light, because that's how they are now driving their mission is by a laser. Unknown to me, by the way, but they said, we read your papers. Um, so I said, okay, I don't think you're going to like the answer, but I'll do it for you. So uh, just to give you a little bit of, of uh, math here, um, at 70% of the speed of light, which is their required speed because they want to get to Pandora in seven years, it's about nine megatons per kilogram, or their spacecraft, which is a thousand tons, is about nine teratons. So <clears throat> those of you who may recall my story about the extinction of the dinosaurs, um, that was about 50 teratons. So we could destroy another civilization by shooting an avatar at them and just creating the land. We'll just impact the planet. Okay. But if you think about this, this corresponds to 3,300 tons per year of matter annihilating. 
So you'd have to carry on board if you wanted to drive this mission by matter antimatter annihilation, you would have to carry on board 3,300 tons of perfect antimatter with no secondary mass to contain it. But then your mission would no longer be 1,000 tons, it would be 1,000 plus 3,300 tons. Okay, so people think antimatter will do anything. Yeah, luckily we haven't developed it in quantity, otherwise what will we do with it? We'd make a bigger bomb, yes? Okay. So go to our website if you want to design your own mission. Um, I got them up to about 66% the speed of light mm -hmm. and about one gigabit per second uh, down leak. So whatever, they didn't like the numbers, but what it is. So this is a picture of their spacecraft from their website. Um, our sail diameter is using a one micron thick sail, which is reasonable. Uh, it's about 66% the speed of light. And if you went down to 0.1 micron, which is conceivable, you get to 80% the speed of light. Okay, but 10 petawatts of power and 100 kilometer array. It's not insane, but it's getting large. Okay, so we made a little movie just to kind of show what it would look like. This is our movie, not theirs. Um, you see a sail and then it's being illuminated by um, a large laser, a very large laser. And then finally on the other side, you see a spacecraft. You might think, well, the sail's gonna collapse on the spacecraft. The answer is no, it's not, because the pressure is extremely low. Because the bigger the sail, the same amount of power, the lower the pressure. So this is their spacecraft. And those big tanks in the back, those are antimatter tanks. But well, I have issues with antimatter. I got, got to go into therapy or something. Okay, so, our system is basically a parallel processing system, okay? It's a phased array, okay? It's called a master oscillator. We have one little laser in it. We split it, we amplify. So it's called master oscillator power amplifier because you have a master oscillator called a seed laser, and then you have amplifiers, and then you can control the phase. So it's basically, it's a Fourier transform device, and you can control the amplitude as well. And then you combine the beams in free space. So there's no upper limit to power, there's our upper limit to flux, by the way. When you get to a certain flux, you tear apart the vacuum, but we're nowhere near that. And then you have a beacon either on your spacecraft or, or in the same direction as your spacecraft, and that's what makes it work. So currently at, at UC Santa Barbara, we're building up the infrastructure for a one meter class system, which will allow us to get to LEO. Okay, a real system, if it's Earth-based, which is where you start for economic reasons, would be about the, uh, you know, size of maybe the McGill campus, something like that. Okay, so this system, again, it's not this one trick pony of sending small things to the stars. It can send whatever you want. It's a question of scaling. So I'm showing here the speed versus array size versus flux in the array here. You can just go to our website and get the papers. Uh, for a one gram, a 10, uh, so one kilogram and a hundred kilogram. So you can get to relativistic speeds with all of them, it just depends on the size of the array and the flux of the array. All right, you want to, you know, get delivery to Mars in eight hours. You can send a kilogram to Mars. Um, you probably have to pay extra for a stopping, but, um, or an hour to the moon, all right? So you can do all kinds of weird things with these systems, but I don't want to bore you with it. One thing we were asked to look at is, could we design a system that could get to Mars with humans in um, a relatively short period of time? So. We came up with a 30-day mission to Mars that launches 100 tons and lands 15 tons. And yes, it does stop, okay? But not by direct momentum transfer, but rather by um, an ion engine that where we reconvert the energy on board to electricity. So there's another paper we published in 2021. We like to publish a lot of papers, so just go to our website, that analyzes a variety of mission parameters. Um, so here's the one to Mars um, in 30 days launch 100 tons, land 15, takes an array that's about 750 meters in diameter, so it's not all that large, and about 500 megawatts. So that's not insane uh, to do that. But the one that's really quite interesting is the CubeSat flyby Mars, which only needs a 10 meter aperture, so about the size of this room, and uh, about one megawatt. So that will get you faster to Mars than any chemistry can, and that's a relatively affordable mission. Okay, so there is a pathway to the stars. Um, it just takes a while to get there. So we're somewhere down here, um, and in 10 years, we could hopefully be up here, sort of 10 to 30 meter class arrays. And then I would say in kind of 30 years plus, we could be out here in the kilometer range to go interstellar. 
This all depends on funding, of course. So what are we doing now? So we're cutting metal now. So if you want to say, when did we start cutting metal for interstellar missions? I don't know if you want to say now, but we're cutting metal. This is not CGI. Okay, this is actually real metal in case you can't tell the difference between real and fake anymore, which is hard to do. Um, it's a really complex problem in phase convergence, however. You have to converge the phase on the target. And unfortunately, if we start on the Earth, you really want to be in space. Like the back side of the moon would be an awesome place to be. But you really want to be space ideally, but for now we're on the surface of the Earth. So you have to overcome the perturbations in the Earth's atmosphere. So it's a very complex adaptive optics system. In theory, it works. Numerically, it works. In the laboratory, it also works. So this is a CGI version of what we're building. Each of these sub-elements is, this is a complete sub-element, all the photonics, all the electronics. You just put DC power in and a fiber in, and that's it. Okay, it's about the size of your arm, and it's about the diameter of your fist. Okay, we're building these now. And then you put them together. And so here's a seven-element array. Put is made together to do what you want. Here's what they look like. It's not pretty, but that's what the current state looks like. Ideally, in the future, you would replace a lot of this with things like photonic integrated circuits, and you would drive the cost down, which is a major issue. We've done thermal analyses. It all works. It's actually pretty slick. It's a you know, little system. You just build a bunch of them. So we're building a ward or a dozen at the moment, and we'll ramp up. So in theory, you know, if someone pays to build a billion of them, or 10 billion, you would go interstellar. Uh, we've done all kinds of laboratory testing, so I don't want to bore you with what it's like to be in a laboratory. We don't just write papers and make CGI and cut metal. Um, this is an optics bench where we're testing the array performance. It doesn't look like we can play. Um, so there was a movie of just how things work. This is a setup where we inject atmospheric perturbations in the system with a deformable mirror. So here's a deformable mirror here. Here's a beam path, and we show that we can actually take out the atmospheric perturbations using our phase convergence algorithm. Um, and I guess I can't play these either. But basically what you see is it does work. Okay, so we'll try to get the movies working separately. Okay, um, part of our focus now is how do you reduce the cost to the point where you could build a billion of these or 10 billion or as many as you need. So we're looking sort of point by point, how do you reduce the cost? So one of the things we have to pay a lot of money for is optics. So we're looking at replacing ground optics with um, replicated plastic optics. So we have a program partially funded by DOD to make metamaterials and various kinds of low-cost replicated optics. And this works really well because we're at a very narrow wavelength um, and we can get extremely high what's called strel. So you can make a really killer optical system that's a thin sheet of plastic um, about uh, 30 microns thick. Okay, and you can mass produce them. So here's a, a master in silicon that we made at UCSB, and we started pulling off uh, replications of it. So that kind of works. Um, we we're still have some work to do there, but it is basically working. One of the things we want to do in the near term, let's say next sort of five-ish years, is land a mission on the moon with a phasing laser to point back to Earth to phase lock our small systems on the Earth, not build a big array, small array, send back power to the moon, which will then appear because it's a sparse array is a series of spots. And then you have a infrared camera board and you take a picture of the moon and you get spots in the moon. So it'd be a good children's story. How did the moon get its spots? By a phased array. It'll be, children will be definitely in therapy on that one. Um, so we make little tiny spacecraft. This is a, a back a deep reactive ion edge silicon and titanium. We also made titanium wafers, it's kind of weird. Um, you could put, which we didn't, about a trillion transistors on something you hold in your hand. It's like a thousand CPUs. System costs. This is a major one. And yes, there's a paper for that. It's like saying there's an app for that. Um, and here's the reference. Go to our website. So we have all kinds of system analysis. You can do an analytic a system analysis. Um, it, but this is a major issue, which I would love people to read and think about. And I'll come back to it in a moment, which is how do you do a realistic cost analysis? So realistic and interstellar probably don't belong in the same sentence here, but you can think about this in a couple of ways. First of all, um, some things like electronics and photonics scale exponentially, or they have been scaling. So I'm part of the problem here because in my 2015 paper, I showed two plots of photonics costs going down with time exponentially, 
and performance going up exponentially is basically like a Moore's law. Like, in fact, it's almost the same. It's about an 18 to 24 month doubling time or halving time and cost. That is just for the tonics and electronics. You are more than the water you drink. So you might say, how much are you worth? Well, you know, the water costs three cents. No, because there's a lot more to you and there's a lot more in the system. People are not exponentially getting better. They're actually getting dumber as far as I can tell. Um, sorry. And they're getting more expensive too, by the way. Um, metal, concrete, land, right? they are not exponential. So we need the rise of the machines to get us out of this. I think people are the problem, by the way, um, if you haven't picked that up. But a really good example is large-scale uh, photovoltaic farms. So if you look at a photovoltaic farm, the cost to install a farm, I know you're going to shoot me, um, is, um, is about a dollar per watt, whereas the cost of the solar cells is less than 10 cents per watt to produce. So you're not dominated by the photonics in that case. Okay, this is what we're building now. Hopefully within two years we'll have this. Um, all kinds of other papers, implications for SETI, you can see across the horizon. You might want to send out propagating life in tardigrades. So we work with a group in biology. You can check that one out. People don't like that one for some reason. Getting back the original idea of planetary defense. We have multiple papers on that. Just came off a program with NASA for directing power into a permanently shadowed region. And again, this is not a one-trick pony. So I'm ending. The conclusions is this is a path forward. Um, it's a bit of a difficult path, but it's the only one that I know that will get you to interstellar capability, at least relativistic interstellar capability. And it appeals to a wide variety of stakeholders. This is key. You give them what they want, they give you what you want. You don't give them what you want, they don't give you what you want. It's also great for students. We've had more than 250 students. Most of them have two eyes left at this point. Um, and it's great for outreach, and I will stop. Unfortunately, we don't have any time for questions for Dr. Lubin, so please feel free to uh, catch him in the hall uh, over lunch or in the hospitality suite. So awesome, thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. Thank you.